City council members have announced their plan to disband the Minneapolis Police Department. We're calling for defunding the police. Shootings in New York City have more than doubled this year. It's the comm center with Drew Breezy or Andrew Baxter, as he's sometimes known. He's elevating his uh, all star <laughs> status on Instagram to becoming a big deal. Drew Breezy or Andrew Baxter, uh, possibly another AKA going into your file soon. You look happy and well for a change, which is uh, quite disparaging to me. I like seeing you sick. How are you? Well, I apologize for that, first of all. I, I did get an, a DM from somebody who showed me that. Uh, the account Graham Allen on uh, Instagram. He, he's a very popular fella. I'm I'm not sure uh, what his background is, but uh, I've been following him for quite a while. He's pretty full of wisdom. But he also located that guy. Somebody helped him locate the 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 guy that was crying. The, the, the first the guy. Beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. The, the one that initially brought us down. And um, <clears throat> so somebody uh, located him for Graham, and he's on the path to you know, wellness or whatever. I mean, obviously it's, it, it's, it, it's, you know, as good news as it's going to be in, in a situation like that, but it's, you know, it kind of doesn't, I, I don't know how to say this. Like it, it's still a problem, you know, and it maybe not necessarily a problem for that guy. Of course, it's still going to be a problem for that guy. And, no, but and it's I'm still that, a problem for veterans. I'm glad that helps going to him though. I mean, it's yeah. it's actually kind of sick if we all just spectate on it and throw up our hands and say like ah oh, man things are really awful for this guy anyway and you know we go to the next thing so i, I sure right. hope that, that guy's doing better and for him to kind of bravely share a story like that i hope some good comes out of it yeah i, I mean that's uh i took that as the the last resort like that this is my desperation and i'm yeah like i don't want to do anything um rash so i would rather just bear my soul to on social media and, and hope that somebody picks it up like really not you know for any other reason than he just doesn't want to have to go through the, the same you know it, it's like I, dental dental extractions like he doesn't want to have to go through the same root canal every time he switches dentists it's it's kind of that was his problem yeah but it's kind of sad though when you when you have to when our culture goes to social media to kind of air its grievances it kind of shows you how disconnected we are that we're kind of just going to kind of put it out there rather than having a confidant or someone that you can kind of go to and talk about this stuff privately. I was on social media earlier today and someone was on there and they posted a picture of themselves crying because they were having relationship problems. And I'm like, oh, you know, am I a throwback to another age? All I know is if I had a personal problem, like this is the last place I would put it. Is this like an attention thing or what? Which I'm not saying about that veteran, you know, that was a totally different situation, but I just wonder how that works now. It's, it seems like the world's kind of passed me by. I don't really understand that stuff. Did we want to go to the voicemails, though? In all seriousness, though, you call those voicemails. I listen to them. Okay, I reached out to a couple people who left us voicemails this week, and I texted them back. And for some reason, they think that's great. They don't think that I'm just some guy, some jabroni in a garage somewhere. I can only assure you that I am. But uh, you reach out to us, and uh, we'll we'll play it on either here on the air, if it's for Comm Center. Uh, I've played a couple of those voicemails, actually, on Hard Time, because we get some correctional-related calls. And if uh, you have a funny confession or a grievance that you want to air and put it out there, not only will we put it out there so that hopefully the person that you hate will hear it and be like, whoa, I need to change my ways. But we can also like tell you how to deal with it or like how to make it worse, depending on what the situation is. So I think it's a great idea, not just because I'm contractually required to get it done. <laughs> you're, well, you're con contractually required to think it's a great idea. Um, OK, so let's go to the voicemails. Go ahead. Today. We're going to go to the voicemail. Engage voicemail function. Hey, John and Drew. It's Andrew from the Midwest here. You know, I, I, a couple of the shows this week have been talking about a lot of mental health issues, and I actually have a couple of really good examples from the corrections world. A lot of free cops and dispatchers don't ever get to see what these people who are suffering from mental health problems look like on the other end when they're getting back on their meds and they are in their right state of mind. When I first started in corrections, we had this gentleman that was on suicide watch, real big guy. He was probably 6'4", 250 pounds of solid muscle, but he was very, very badly schizophrenic. And I guess this guy had been a medical student at the local university before his 
disease had actually been triggered in his mind and caused him to go, you know, start to lose it. And he was a very, very intelligent guy, but when I met him, he'd been off his meds. He was entirely nonverbal. He barely responded to us when we would talk to him at all. He was, you know, barely would even recognize that we were there. He just paced around his cell all day. So he did. If we gave him a, gave him a tray for meals, he would dump it on the floor and just keep walking. Well, about six months later, this guy got sent off to the state mental hospital, got put back on his meds, got back to where he was coherent and actually himself, and got sent back to us so that he could go through with his trial and deal with court case. Completely different individual. And he asked me one day while I was doing my rounds and asked me if I had any interactions with him before he had gone to the hospital. I said, yeah. This guy would just hung his head, said, man, I am so sorry. That is not me. That is not who I am. That was, I was off my meds and I was completely out of it. And we had about a 45 minute conversation with this very, very intelligent, very bright, very smart, very, very well, you know, well-spoken individual. Unfortunately, he thought he was having a conversation with a parakeet. Perfectly normal. I don't know where he's at now. I, I hope the very best for him. I know that he wrapped up his legal case and has moved on with his life. and hasn't been back since then that I've known it. For anybody, if you are ever feeling like you're having a mental health problem, please seek care. If you are one of those people that is, is thinking about or considering harming yourself or killing yourself, reach out. Call someone you love. Call someone you don't love. Call someone. Talk to somebody. Get some help. Guns up, giddy up, y'all. Hey, guys. That's a great message, Andrew. Thank you very much. That was uh, that was insightful and uh, inspiring at the end, um, but I couldn't help uh, – making fun of it in the middle. Could, couldn't help it, but it, ultimately it's a good message about empathy. You got to remember when you're a first responder, 911 dispatcher, police officer, you're encountering somebody the worst day of their life. Most of the time they're at a low point. They're at a point where when they come back from that, they're going to feel shame about it. And it's just more rem- important to remember if you can to have empathy because everyone's better than the worst thing they've ever done. They're better than the worst day they've ever had. But also many people are not their mental illnesses either. You know, we, people need help. And if we can help help them up and get to a better place, you know, that's that's the way to solve a lot of our problems that we have going on in this country. We know mental health is a huge issue. We know it's putting a strain on all of our systems, whether it's, you know, paramedics, dispatchers, police officers. We know it's the answer. So show a little compassion, a little empathy, and hopefully we can help each other out. Um, I have two things on this. Uh, th- there's somebody in the chats. So I don't want to identify who they are, but um, I happen to know that <clears throat> they had a, a pretty serious incident at their workplace. Um, <clears throat> there was somebody that was killed outside their workplace. And um, they may or may not be, uh, they're usually in the chats. I don't know if they're in here tonight, but um, the sad part was, you know, there was just a little um, DMing going on between me and that person. And I, I just wanted to check on them. And, uh, you know, they, they offered some of the story. And the sad part of the story is that uh, the corporation was generally more concerned about keeping people working and productive mm-hmm. yeah. while the investigation was going on. So just outside that door, one of their very own coworkers was killed, brutally killed on a smoke break or whatever. And uh, they were a little bit more worried about like, well, you can't leave anyway. Uh, and, and th- this, these are the kinds of things like, you know, we talk about trauma all the time and we talk about these traumatic calls and, and all this other stuff, but, um, th- this, these are contributing factors as well. Your administration in, in a, in a law enforcement agency or in a fire department or in a, a com a communication center or whatever, they're going to contribute to your mental health just as well. It, it, and I'm telling you, some of the studies will show you that internal pressure from management is probably one of the greatest drivers of stress or ill mental health. I mean, it's, you know, obviously some of it's medical, but um, some of it is not. Would you? Well, agree? The, I, I definitely would. And, you know, to to say, well, you know, we're, we're going to keep going. You know, I understand they've got to keep the doors open on the business. They've got to keep offering, you know, <laughs> salary wages, uh, whatever medical medical benefits. So, so, you know, in a sense, I understand the, the continuation there, but you almost just have to stop and you have to recognize what happened. And you owe it to that person and their dignity to say, like, well, you know what? We're not going to work today. Let's have a critical incident debrief. 
you know, maybe you can bring in people that will do that. And then you, you know, everyone can kind of talk about it. And then, you know, once people feel acknowledged and you, you move on, it's not, it's not that the trauma is over or anything like that, but you, you know, you've begun to do right by them. And when you do right by them, they're going to be more productive because they see that you care. Yeah. It's, it's not just a morale issue. It's, it's the right thing to do. It's just humanity. I mean, like it doesn't really cost anything. Yeah. It might cost your business a little bit, uh, that night or that evening, um, if you're non-governmental, but, um, there was a murder outside the door. (laughs) Aren't you expected to lose a little bit of money, uh, when something like that happens? So, uh, then the other thing I wanted to mention that, that Andrew's phone call kind of covered was, uh, there's a guy on YouTube that I admire and I admire his bravery. And I think I've talked about him on here before. Maybe it was on the big show. What, you know, the, the major show on this network, um, <clears throat> the, on Fridays. Uh, but at any rate, never heard he has, of it. I think he has some kind of schizophrenia or he has some kind of, he, he, in a, he goes through these psychotic episodes and when he's going through the psychotic episode, he feels it he hits record and he's got his girlfriend in the room with him and he just documents the entire thing. So you can see what it's like to go through a psychotic episode. And it's probably, it probably started so he can rewind and see what it's like himself. So when that doctor showed back up to the, to the jail and started to apologize and had this normal conversation and, you know, is regulated on the medication and everything, it's a wonderful thing. But when you're encountering a mentally ill person out on the street, um, you know, just bear that in mind. Like th- these people are just some, some of these people are just a little bit of medicine away from being your brother or, or your sister or your father or whatever. And um, you know, that, that is a driver of homelessness as well. It's, it's ill mental health. Like it's, they, they just, you know, like they think, we saw it last week and on Friday's show, like, uh, what did he say? I'm, I am the, I'm security for the world, which, you know, is probably a double entendre, but, um, you know, maybe, it, maybe it is kind of, uh, of a hallucination. Well, so, I speak, you know, speaking of mental health, I can't imagine what that poor officer is going through with all the stress, but then, you know, now she's got this memory of not only killing a person, but what it's like, you know, that vulnerability and helplessness when you discharge your firearm and the guy's still coming at you. I mean, oh. that was, uh, that bothered me and I've never, I'm not a police officer, but just the idea that you're trying to stem a threat and then they, they just keep coming. I mean, like you, you and Tansy talked about that's nightmare stuff and she's lived it. She's yeah. I mean, and it's just, th- there is that recurring dream that police officers have. And I, I've actually got a couple DMS or actually YouTube comments about uh, people having the exact same dream, either the cement trigger or the bullets just trickle, trickle out or, and it's just, it's about, the fear of being unprepared, um, according to some dream analysts. I mean, powerlessness to, to, to confront the danger. Yeah. Because you're in that situation all the time, every single day. Um, I've had some weird dreams about prison. I have left there eight years ago and you know, every once in a while still I'm, I'm having dreams about something of that nature. So that stuff sticks with you. I mean, I've been out of there for a long time, but some nights it feels like I'm back inside the walls again. Hmm. Love listening to the show. Even if it's not the big show, you're doing a great job and bringing some good awareness. I have a question that's been burning at me the last few years. So I'm wondering, is it okay to call someone a dispatcher or do I have to call people a communicator now? Because communication center and everybody seems a little touchy about the different words. I want to make sure we're calling it right. Appreciate all you do. Thank you. Hey, that's a great question. Uh, go ahead and take it, John. I, I've got a take on it. The funny thing is, is that I've always, you know, there's so much in, in titles. There's a power in name and there's a power in title. And I've never really felt like anything that you use to describe my job is accurate. Like sometimes I call myself a 911 operator because I, I operate a complex system or I dispatch things, which means I give things to other people. Or uh, Abby does this thing where she, every time she refers to my profession, she delineates call takers from dispatchers. Uh so, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the correct nomenclature is. All, all I know is, is that we're probably mad about something else if we're yelling at you about what you're calling us. So <laughs> I, all, I w- all I would say is if you're a corrections officer or a correctional officer, don't call us a guard because we're that's not that's not correct. That's the only thing that I'll kind of get wound up about. Drew, what's your what's your hot take from when you were a, a dispatcher back in 1985? 
uh, back in the 1900s, uh, the um, it, it didn't bother me. What, like it, it, when somebody co- checked for a warrant or whatever, they would say, "Okay, what's your operator number?" And you'd give them operator 43. There were one or two. Th- that was my old comp center number, operator 43. Mine's uh, nine. When you add it up, it's four. It's seven, four, and three. I, I've got seven connected to me somehow. But listen. It didn't matter to me. It mattered to some people. Like th- there was, there was one woman that I worked with in particular that if you called her an operator, she's she would take a high offense to it. And that was back a long, long time ago. Um, I, I make that distinction, and I think Abby is just just being um, uh, conscientious about it. I make the distinction between emergency call takers and dispatchers. Because here in the state of Florida, they're not necessarily synonymous. They're not one and the same. They're different certifications. Or they're different classes when you're hired. So one can do both, but there's but the other one can't do both in, until they're certified to do the other one. So um, I, I don't think that you need to worry about the proper, uh, like, let's call them telecommunicators now. It's National Telecommunicators Week or whatever. That's I, a bit I think of a mouthful to me, but I mean, yeah, that's yeah, the technical yeah. term. And, and I noticed, like, I, I follow the guy that runs the LAPD uh, comm center. Um, I, I noticed, like, when he refers to the the dispatchers or telecommunicators or by title, it, they're like, <laughs> they've got, you know, LA's always got this weird striping system and senior patrol LPR2.1 uh, Johnson. You know, I mean, they've got this long, long... You know, I, you know, I'm not picking on them. They they have these like PSR, which is uh, or PSO something or community something officer or so. Different agencies have different titles for them. I think in the industry, it's it's. I guess it would be like the telecommunicator industry, but some are dispatchers, some are just plain old uh, yeah, emergency call takers. Some are just like, how about you just fucking leave me alone <laughs> and don't call me anything. So I. I I think it's uh, very kind to to not want to step on their toes, um, but That's true. you asked us, why don't you ask the dispatchers? Why don't you ask the telecommunicators that you run across and see what they prefer, and then you could slip them a little card that says, "Tune in Thursday nights, eight four eight com nine one one. That's eight four eight two six six sixty nine eleven, and get nice. them to follow us and get them to call us." John, there's a third voicemail. I'm getting ready to play it. Let's do it. I like hey, it. Drew. My name is um, Elizabeth Carter, and I'm calling you from um, Georgia, from uh, the Atlanta area. And there is a story that I want you guys to look into doing because hardly anybody, I mean, hardly anybody knows about it. Um, I want you to please look up First Lieutenant Ashley Henderson Huff. She was killed in action uh, in Iraq. Uh, um, oh gosh, I think it was September 19th of 2006. Or two th- yeah, 2006. Um, please look her up, and I need you guys to tell her story. Uh, if you want to uh, contact her dad, I can get that information for you. Um, but but the world has to know about her. Um, the Iraqi police that she trained, she was a, um, an MP and she was training, uh, Iraqi police and, um, was killed by an, um, IED. They actually built a statue to her outside of their training academy. I mean, this is like blowing your mind kind of stuff that the world does not know about this uh if you want to call me back on it my number is four yeah i'm gonna cut that off uh Uh, is there anything more to that uh voicemail john do you remember well it could be phone number it could be something good for coming up for memorial day i I just looked it up it is uh, h-u-f-f is how it's spelled the travis Mannion foundation uh lists uh you know her the day that she was killed in action where she's from her date of birth uh, and kind of looks like uh, her actions in Mosul. The thing that struck me about that is um, you think of how women are regarded in Middle Eastern countries and, and cultures right. in general. And uh, definitely to to have an impact on 
the people that she trained that they erected a statute. I mean, a statue, not a statute. Um, but if, uh, and I don't know if it was the Iraqis who did that or the Americans or whatever, but, um, yes, thank you very much, Elizabeth, for calling us. Uh, I, I, I haven't deleted the thing. I just didn't want to put your phone number over the, over the air. Uh, so we're going to go to one of our standbys. Captain, comm center, comm center, captain, Micah. Hey guys, this is Sergeant. I'm sorry. Um, captain Micah, that reminds me, I got to call admin and ask for a raise. Uh, if you guys are listening to this on another episode of Com Center with Drew Breezy, uh, Andrew Baxter with the blue check mark, uh, Josh, aka Dead Lighting Media, and uh, John. That's right. I'm also here. Yeah. Um, I just got done with a perimeter check, so I appreciate the questions from you guys, uh, the dirty DMs from Lumber Chef, uh, <laughs> etc. <cetera. laughs> it's been a busy week. Um, been watching Hands and Intent. Um, so far had two people likely fired and I have a 10 day to look forward to tomorrow, but it's just a, it's a good reminder that anybody who's threatening, uh, people's safety, the public or each other's just, they, they got to go. So I uh, appreciate you guys keep up the buddy check-ins. Um, I, I did share last week. I've been dealing with some professional and some uh, personal trauma for a while now. And uh, it's been two, weir- two years. I'm still waiting on a call um, wow. for an appointment to, to speak to somebody. So I just wanted to say uh, take care of each other, guys. Travis, I'm calling from Tampa, Florida area. And uh, love the show. Uh, I just have an issue with the most recent episode when you guys were talking about the bees. I feel like you guys missed a golden opportunity to play the sound clip from Tommy Boy when they were being attacked by the fake bees and telling the police their firearms were useless and run and save themselves. Don't let that happen again, fellas. Do you have comedy gold like that at your fingertips? Use it. Thanks, guys. I'll talk to you later. I just want to say that I wanted to play that, and Drew said no. (laughs) Because of copyright. He's like, I don't want to get us demonetized. I don't want to be haunted by the ghost of Chris Farley. For- we uh, literally had the discussion before we went on, the, again, behind don't the scenes. Don't gaslight me, Drew. I'm telling you, Travis, we're on the same page because I was like, do you not remember this thing from Tommy Boy where they're like, my, my firearms, your firearms are useless? And uh, he said, uh, th- then the one cop looks at the other is like, Davey. I'm allergic to bees. And the other guy's like, I am too. And they just got out of there. We'll, we'll come um, back and we'll check on you later. Holy shnikes, it worked. Uh, Michael August makes a great point. We could have played that clip from The Wicker Man. I mean, I do like that scene where Nicholas Cage is just getting fucking stung to death. That's good. I like that one. It's good acting. <laughs> yeah, I, we don't know that that was acting. But yeah, so we did discuss that. And and then John made it right. I mean, you know, and I even posted that as a uh, as a short on YouTube. And I'm sure it got 35 views. So, And uh, Andrea also mentioned My Girl. I, I mentioned that movie last week where the poor innocent boy, very much about the same age as me. And he's in that movie. And his only crime was was loving someone else. And he was stung to death by millions of bees. <laughs> It's, and I saw that movie when I was way too young. It does uh it does ring true with uh one of the members of this show more than they're, the other. They're the snakes of the sky, Drew. We have to stop them. <laughs> they are the, the they are the um that joke was for a very specific person. I, I hope they appreciate it. The snakes of the sky is is a wonderful reference. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that you have a quick news story, and uh, we we have gone 41 minutes without discussing anything no. about police, really. We do not have a like show it. tonight, folks. Uh, something weird that I just <laughs> wanted to say, like, I don't know if this is because of spring and people are leaving their homes. Like here, you know, like wherever I live, way up north, people kind of hunker down. We tend to hibernate. It's very, it's very common that you have welfare checks done and police go in. They'll find people under pounds of blankets. And there's just empty peanut butter jars and uh, Mountain Dew bottles full of urine. People kind of, you know, they kind of, you know, hibernate for the winter. But people are coming out, I guess. It's finally springtime here. We've seen a huge uptick of 911 hang-up calls where 911 rings 
and there's nobody in the line and I have to listen to their lawnmower or I have to listen to them swearing at their children to do better in school or listening to their filthy sex sounds or whatever it is I'm forced to hear against my will. I and wonder, I, John, uh, if you Googled that, if it would be a common problem. <laughs> what I would like to do, I propose to you in the room, is that <laughs> what I could do is I could look for some news to talk about on Com Center. I Googled 911 dispatchers in the news, and I'm seeing here uh, from WKOW, 911 dispatch centers across southern Wisconsin report dramatic uptick in 911 hangup calls. That's in Iowa County, Wisconsin. Uh, Everett police see increase in 911 hangup calls. That's from KOMO News. That was that's three hours old. And of course, uh, don't forget Ada County, Idaho. They are seeing a dramatic uptick in accidental 911 calls. Folks, 911 is under siege from your butts, from your pockets, from your cup holders, <laughs> and it is driving people nuts. I took nine today. I am up to like 143 for the year, some ridiculous number like that. Um, please handle your phones carefully. Please disable your 911 function. I don't have an iPhone, so I don't really understand how that works. I'm sure Drew could talk about it because Drew's retired and Drew can afford an iPhone and he probably knows about how all that works. Uh, but what we're seeing in the news it could just confirms what's going on here is that uh, it's it's all over the place that 911 pocket dials, ass dials are way up. And uh, it, it, in all seriousness, it is annoying, but it does bog down the system when you have to put on like an actual 911 on hold to triage this other 911 call coming in, you know, like you're taking a structure fire or a vehicle accident and 911's ringing and you're the only one available and you're answering it and you're hearing a lawnmower. Uh, so police your phone better. And if you do dial 911, if you look down at your phone and you say it's calling the police, just hold it up to your head and say, I'm sorry, we are not going to send a Black Hawk helicopter to come abduct you and like hit you with a wet noodle. We just want to know you're okay so we can terminate the call. We can close yeah, it up. Uh, also, no, we're not joking. You, you know what I mean? That that was the biggest thing I used to get all the time. Like, hey, this is 911. Are you okay? Do you have an emergency? You're joking. No, no, no. I'm not joking. You, or, or they, they accuse you of lying. Well, then why That's, does it say this other number? Like, well, because right. I'm going who to is say 911 when I call you. <laughs> like, I could send a deputy sheriff to your house to knock on your door. You could just tell me everything's all right. Or you could dial 911 if you want and talk to me again to prove or it. You can just like clear your throat if there's somebody holding a gun to your head but the, a lot of what about this bees, though i've taken a lot of phone calls with suspicious b sounds over the last week that is a threat yeah I that's uh, that seriously there's an uptick in bees uh so uh, there's an uptick in bee stories for sure um what i want to say is this because it'll make me look like a genius if it's true uh in fact let's just posit that it's true when uh, iphone updates to a new operating system or when uh, Samsung pushes something out or when Sony pushes something out or, or uh, what's the other major manufacturers? Um, Smith Tech is what I have. What do you Smith have? Tech. Swift Tech? No, Smith did... Tech 500. <laughs> Smith Tech 500. Yep. No, the phone, like the Google phone. What's the, what's the major, the, the opposing? Google okay, Pixel. The Pixel. Yeah. When these, when these manufacturers start pushing updates out, sometimes, there's either a glitch in it or there is a um uh like like you know they don't realize it but they've programmed the volume down button if you hold it down for six seconds that it calls it calls 911 there there was a big issue with that when the new um uh i i, I apple watches came out um like it was a, there was a new version of an apple watch that came out and uh it included cellular in it so when you banged your the crown of your watch or whatever, it would call nine one one. So there was like the uptick in that. It, it just it happens from time to time. Sometimes it's technology. Other times, it's uh, just slow news day, and they are all sharing the same news service because that's how this country is run. Yeah, it's true. There is just copy and paste of the news. I should actually go through them, but just see where they edit out Ada County and put in Iowa County. And just <laughs> boy, things sure are rough here at home. <laughs> wherever that may be we're going to uh kind of get into uh what we're uh here to do uh tonight and this is a critical incident IMPD out of began the, issuing body worn cameras out of the indianapolis metro police department this is what uh this is um look full disclosure what I wanted to do with this was uh, cover this incident because it's it's harrowing and and you know it's something for you to watch it's something to f to feast your eyes on, 
the bad guys, uh, the bad guy lost. The good guys, though they were shot, survived. So, you know, it's a little bit of a happier moment than than normal. Um, but normally we like to make sure that there's a communications element in this. In other words, we want to talk about the radio traffic on there or why they're saying what they're saying or what they're saying sometimes to translate for you. Or if there's a 911 call or if there's something similar to that, there always has to be a communications aspect because it's always been my opinion that we're overlooking what the communications people do. Plus, it's the uh, main thing that keeps us different from that lousy Friday show. Having the 911 <laughs> dispatcher have something to do. Well, the, he, the deal is with this. Uh, I did a public records request for the radio traffic. Uh, it has not returned. And this is good footage. I think it's. Uh, I think there are lessons to be learned. Uh, listen, when I used to teach interviews and interrogations, I would tell you, um, you don't you don't always have to get the confession. In fact, that's the, the goal of any good interview is to get truthful information. It's not to get a confession. A confession is nice, but sometimes confessions are false, so you have to be very cautious of that. Oftentimes, though, when you interview somebody, it's what they don't say, or it's the story that they've stuck to, and you can investigate around that. You can determine that that's all untruthful, that that could never happen, therefore you know they're lying, which is just as good as an, adm an admission or sometimes just as good as a confession. I'm going to play that same logic and that same mind game with this tonight. The fact that there isn't a whole lot of radio traffic and a whole lot of communication communicating going on is what we are probably going to end up talking about more because oftentimes we fail as officers to, to include the communications people in what we're doing. And when you see how quickly the shit hits the fan, you really, uh, you really want people to know where you are so people can get to you fast. I'm not saying that that's the case here. I, I haven't been able to analyze the radio traffic or, um, and, and I'm very thankful that, uh, you know, they, they had, a, they seem to have a good group of guys on that task force that work together to, um, you know, make sure everybody else was safe. But, uh, apparently what happened is they were surveilling this guy. They went to the, they went to make a traffic stop on him. He emerged from his, um, residents with a soft case, a rifle case, got in the driver's side uh, of his car. The pass, uh, there was a second person that got in the passenger side. They, they took off and they decided at whatever point that there was probable cause to pull him over slash um, uh, affect the traffic stop because either they had, uh, you know, either they had a traffic infraction or it was just time to take this guy down. I don't know if they had a warrant for him or if they had probable cause for his arrest. They they saw him getting into the vehicle with us, I believe, with a soft rifle bag. So they might have had reason to believe that he was moving some merchandise right then, or moving a move moving a possible murder weapon. Oh, m moving product. So his well, name. Is, well, uh, I mean, if he was a suspect in a shooting, and if they can get him right there with the gun, I mean, and you you have intelligence to back this up, and you suppose you even have a warrant or something, wouldn't that be good enough for you to just go ahead and pull him over and get him before he can? If you have the warrant, sometimes uh, sometimes officers don't have that. Uh, sometimes they have exigent like, circumstances, though, like that. Could it's be not. Bad. Yeah. No, I agree, I, I, and it's not always the exit. But but I'm going to tell you. If it's a task force situation, there's multiple agencies involved. I, as the supervisor, shift commander, am going to say, let's make sure that that's an FCIC, NCIC. Let's make sure that the warrant has been approved because unless you're going to arrest this guy on probable cause, you could take that warrant to a judge conceivably, get into this shootout, and the judge, and while you're without knowing what's happening, the judge might go, you don't this isn't enough. Your case is over. The guy knows you're following <laughs> yes. him. You're you're, yes. you're busted. They, 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 the angry captain says, get me your badges and your guns. Get out of here. The only way to get your jobs back is to investigate this on your own time. But don't you do that. You know, and then that's what you, you want my do. shield. Here's my shield. You want my, shield? You want my here's peace. My here's my peace. Here's my peace. OK, so here's this. Uh, this is the um, the footage from the. um. Oh look, it's uh, Lewis. I, I really wanted to get into some of the stuff that he shot. He's a good, he's a good dude. Uh, th this is footage from a uh, surveillance camera in um, Indianapolis or the surrounding area. This is so. As I was starting to tell you, they attempted to pull this guy over first. He immediately takes off. They attempted to 
uh, pursuit intervention technique maneuvers, pit maneuvers. And if you don't know I, what that is, I'm going to demonstrate with my hands. Very nice. Drew is doing an obscene gesture, clearly a gang sign or <laughs> some kind of, it's clearly sexual, very offensive. I'm, I'm taking him out of the stream now. What they do is they try to match up the front wheel of their patrol car with the back wheel of the, the bad guy's car and you turn right into it. And then you just keep driving and you'll avoid collision, but it'll spin the, the car out. And that way the person behind you can get in front of them. So um, it's, it's a very effective technique in, uh, in a lot of agencies are going to two things. First of all, they're going to these gun squads that are doing a lot of, to, to curb gun violence, they're going to a lot of these gun squads where they're following up on gun uh, purchases or gun information, not, not second amendment stuff, but like when uh, it, it used to be, if it was if there was just a shooting, it was just a shooting, unless it was a homicide, right? So if it's a homicide, it's a big deal. Well, how many shootings are you going to tolerate, and how many homicides, or how many shootings would have been homicides, save a couple centimeters, right? So uh, a lot of the agencies are smartening up to say, let's figure out where the guns are coming from. Let's let's get the felons that are in possession of these guns that shouldn't have them by state law or or whatever, let's get them off of the streets and get, get them back into prison. Um, because guns are, it, 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 guns can be bad if they're in the wrong hands, right? I've heard that. So, so they have uh, they tried to, to stop this guy. He made a couple left turns. Bottom line is he jumped, uh, he drove down the, uh, the, the alley of this uh, business and it was caught on surveillance camera. So we'll see, we'll pick it up from there. It, 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 it kicks off quick. So uh, just kind of stand by. I, I would I would probably focus my attention on this gray pickup truck here because you're going to see the green car just start flying right past it. Now, f following very close behind in a Dodge Charger that's marked with the red and blue lights activated is uh, Detectives De Leon and Phelps, I think his name is. So they're directly behind this guy. Well, I guess what this guy didn't realize is when he turned down this like little side alley here, he hit a dead end. He had nowhere to go, so he jumped out of his car with his the rifle that was in his soft case and just started firing. And immediately, uh, or almost immediately, there's just like a volley of gunfire. Almost immediately, he hit um, Detective De Leon, or he he hit one of the two. They're they're uh, they're in uniforms. They've got rifles, and a, a, it's just a classic gunfight. They're taking cover behind a vehicle. De Leon gets hurt. He's down. Uh, Drew, we should probably just play the audio at some point. I mean, that's that's pretty. I, I am stuff. clicking uh, furiously the on-off switch of the uh, of the speaker thing, and it's just not working for me. Uh, Detective De Leon's body-worn camera video ah. begins just before the pursuit was initiated on North Post Road. The pit maneuvers occurred just after the westbound turn onto thought. East Thirtieth Street. Shots fired by Mr. Gebri Iwitt at the officers can be heard before Detective De Leon exited his patrol car. Recording. Moving over to number two lane. It's going to be a black van. Tom King seven. This is exactly what a a surveillance sounds like. I mean, whether you're in a patrol car or in a regular car, it's like, hey, he's in the number two lane. He's traveling southbound. We're passing the the Wendy's, and you know, so people can get a time marker of how far behind they are. And a frosty. Uh, yeah, I got two cars for cover, you know, like I got two cars in between us. We're coming up on a red light. So it kind of alerts everybody else to speed up a little bit if they, if they're so they don't get caught by the red light. Seven, six, Ocean King Tom. Tom is going to be a shooting suspect. He might be taking off. He's going to be, he's going to take. He's uh, set up to go westbound on 30th. From coast. We got a lot of movement before. Uh, hold on a second. No, 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 no. He's going to go uh, west on 30th. So they're riding two band cars here too. So um, he's calling out the surveillance. He's looking for a the place to run. He's giving the license plate to the dispatcher too, so the dispatcher could see if the vehicle has already been involved in another felony, or if it's stolen, or something like that, or if it has someone else associated with the vehicle, or just Great to point. identify it. Yeah, yeah, and oftentimes uh, they'll ask, "Hey, who does that come back to?" Because that's just um, in big thinking it's good to verify that you're following the right vehicle one and two it's good to have that radio traffic so if something does end up happening later on in life 
you can say, yeah, not only did I run the, the tag, but they came back with this registered owner. Yeah, if that vehicle gets away, I, I could initially, I could put out a, a bolo or be on the lookout for that, you know, citywide or countywide or wherever it needed to be. And I, I would be able to, to let anyone know exactly what vehicle we're looking for and why. So I could put that out as a bolo, but I can also change the status of the vehicle so that if, suppose they skip town, they go down to Arizona, they get away. Well, somebody down in Glendale runs that tag. They can see like, hey, this is a felony vehicle. This is wanted by Indianapolis Metro Police Department. You know, was involved in a flight after a felony stop and hold for prints and the whole deal. So you can put a lot of information in that. There's a lot of reasons why you would want to run that tag. And the dispatchers make a lot of use of that out of that. Okay, so the um, Indianapolis Metro PD was kind enough to give us uh, like uh, visual cues of what what's about to take place. So what this says in the lower left is uh, pit maneuver in seven, and it's a countdown. So there's going to be within seven seconds, there'll be a pit maneuver. <laughs> Boom! Shut the car! So they're obviously pulled up alongside. Now he turns into the vehicle. You can see it very clearly. He turned right. And now he's having to explain. And you can see the trees rushing by his windshield. Uh, it may not necessarily be a high speed chase. Because it seems to me that he only turned. He turned. Uh, he, he didn't pit him out. He turned. And then the guy's going to make another turn in about nine seconds. And that's where he ends up going. Hey, relax, 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 relax. Down the uh, alleyway. So he has now turned into the business parking lot. You can see the officer turning left from his body cam. And you'll hear the part. Watch out, watch out, watch out. He's got a head tree. He's got a head tree. Stop! Officer's out of the car. That's fired. He's out the bag. He's uh, reloading, reloading. Okay, so that's that's a, this is a good uh, kind of pause point. He's he gets down on one knee. He he jumps out of his car, out of the driver's side of his car. We're still looking at the driver's body worn cam. He gets out of the car. He had already emptied an entire magazine out towards you know he's he's putting bullets down range where this guy is shooting back at them. He goes for cover because when you want to reload to when you want to do a tactical reload, you definitely want to be behind some type of cover and you'll hear him say audibly i'm reloading reloading or he says something we, we used to have what we called alpha and bravo like it, we would call alpha so that you would know that i am ducked behind somewhere trying to reload and i would yell bravo when i'm back in the game and then you know i would yell echo when i'm completely empty so we did uh, that dodgeball it, too actually Right. I mean, that's the, it's an old actually we we took that from dodgeball. So uh, Alpha and Bravo is very common or, uh, hey, I'm reloading. It's it's all about the communication, though, because your partner is going to wonder why you're not throwing uh, bullets downrange just like they yeah, if are. You're not, if you're not firing, he might worry that you just took a headshot and that you're dead. So that's why you would say that. Right. And, and if you're going to be, you don't want to be out exposed to these uh, high powered rounds that are coming right back at you. If you're tr just, you, you kind of, we, we practice enough at the range so that you're reloading without looking at your firearm. Uh, but uh, when you're in the middle of a firefight, it's a little bit different. Your, your motor skills, your fine motor skills start to uh, play tricks on you. Ah! Oh! I'm hit! 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 i am hit 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 i Put a turn again up. Which one? On my right foot. Oh, fuck. So there's another officer behind him. Is Detective the Phelps, body warning. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know what you're getting ready to say, but um, th there's an officer that comes up. He's from the car behind them, and he, he's um, trying to administer some aid. But th they're also still in the middle of a firefight. So even though you're you're out of the game, 
so to speak, with a with a you know with a bum foot because you've been shot. Uh, it, it, and you know, for all intents and purposes, we don't know. I mean, it could he he could have blew his foot off. Like, so it's more than just uh, he got shot in the foot. But um, here here somebody comes up to try to assist him, at least keep him safe and secure, like behind some kind of cover while they can get some medical aid to him. But they're still engaged in a firefight with the guy. The threat's still active. Camera video begins just before the pit maneuver on East 30th Street. During the exchange of gunfire, Detective Phelps reported that Detective DeLeon had been shot. Detective Phelps was shot in the torso but remained engaged as Mr. Gabriel Iwitt continued to fire at officers. Yeah, th- this is a good point Mike is bringing up because I see people chattering here about the car is not going to stop a bullet. You know what else is not going to stop a bullet? Open air. Uh, so you just, you definitely want to uh, at least get somewhere behind where they can't make yourself a hard target. One and two, get behind something that will slow the bullet down or change the trajectory or do something. Uh, but if you're standing out in front of your, your car, you're foolish. If you've got cover to get behind, get behind it. It's not necessarily going to, um, it's not necessarily going to stop every bullet, but it's, it's not, it's not futile. It's not like it's in your way. Use it to your no. advantage yeah. to either conceal yourself or to cover yourself. Something else to think about is if he is firing from a rifle, which I'm not sure he is, but like that's a high velocity round. Okay. So like Drew said, if you could slow it down with a car, maybe that's a, a now a round that your armor won't be penetrated by. So there's, I, I mean, just put yourself in a situation. You can either dive behind the car, or you can stand there and get blasted. I think you, you know what the obvious thing to do is. One thing I wanted to circle back, Drew, is you heard a computer voice there kind of giving a countdown uh, for all those uninitiated, you know, yeah. half myself included. Did you want to tell us a little bit about what that is? OK, so they explained at the beginning of this, uh, we, we it was either muted or we didn't have audio at the po- at that point. But they explained what their uh, system of body worn cameras is. And it's a little bit different than the axon system that a lot of people see. You'll see the axon symbol and the, you know, the, the kind of, uh, patented two lines of timestamp and unit and all that. Most body cameras are, are made by Axon. It's a company, it's the same company that makes taser and they, um, you know, they, they house all the data and they, they do all this other stuff and they're in the equipment business. So most people use Axon, most agencies or a lot of agencies across America use Axon systems. Now, this is not an Axon system. This is something else. If they, if they showed it at the beginning, I think, uh, and it's it's like basically an iPhone cell phone holder that you conceal in your uh, shirt. And one of your shirt buttons is actually a grommet that uh, is wide enough so that the lens can peek out from, you know, the concealment of your shirt. So... They use a different kind of system, and there are some uh, s- there are some safety mechanisms built into these things. If your uh, the, the the camera's going to activate if you get within uh, fifty feet of uh, of a scene of an incident scene, like it's tracking your GPS, so it knows your camera's going to activate if uh, your gun comes out of your holster. Let's say I don't know if that's exactly the case in here. Um, but it's also going to activate if your horizontal, if it detects your horizontal for more than, you know, this, I, I think it was set for 40 seconds. So every 10 seconds, the computer voice was saying, you know, we're going to initiate uh, an emergency call in 20 seconds, initiating emergency call in 10 seconds. And what it's going to do is either it, it's going to somehow uh, like notify the communication center that you got somebody down there. There are actual radios that do that. There are like your regular patrol radios. They have little. Uh, I explained it to John. Button. Yeah, yeah. Well, down... first of all, there's the red, the red button, which you know when you hit the red button, it'll override all radio traffic. It but opens there's it also, up. Yep. There's also there's also like a, a like a rocker uh, switch, like a level, and and if the level is off, it detects that you're down. It will automatically trigger that basically that red button, so it overrides all radio traffic because it it assumes that you're down and you're unable to talk. Go ahead, John. Yeah, what it does is it basically will send a message to the comm center saying, "Hey, you know, um, you know, every every radio has a number, so it'll say like you know fifty one down or whatever." And the dispatcher will look at a list and say like, "Well, that's officer so and so." What I would do is attempt to 
initiate voice, con voice contact with him. We do that with like saying, hey, unit so-and-so, status check, checking your status, 1023. Basically, we're making sure that that person's okay because we've already got a, a sign of distress. We might also ask officers that we already who, who are, we already know are on scene, hey, we've got this uh, you know man down button coming from so-and-so. Can you check their status and advise? And uh, sure enough, in this case, we know that he's already been hit. We're watching the camera, but you'll see that he pushes up off the ground. Uh, the reason why he does this is to turn off his alarm because he's already in a gun battle. There's already probably a lot of radio traffic going on. He's okay. So he doesn't want dispatch alerted to the fact that he's down. So he he sits up when there's about 10 seconds left, which turns off the alarm. Now, if he was unconscious, if he was grappling with someone, obviously he would just you know stay horizontal. That switch is going to trip. It'll alert the comm center and they will know to send more help going. So super helpful if you're on your own. If you're already in a gunfight, it's just sort of superfluous at that point. Drew, go ahead. We'll keep moving. Recording. Move! Set the car! Okay, so this is Detective Phelps. He, he attempted, before they pit maneuvered, tried the pit maneuver, he attempted to jump out and just grab the guy. Or, you know, grab, grab the driver's door of the, of the suspect. And the guy took off. That's why they ended up having to try the pit. Fuck! You're good. Hey, relax, 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 relax. The driver's getting a little wound up. The Phelps is calming him down. Phelps has got a gun at the ready. They're not even stopped, and he has his pistol in his hand, ready to fire. Left yeah, hand on the door handle, ready to jump out. Excellent point, John. He's got his gun out in the car, like so. He's pointing it through the windshield. You're going to have to. If he starts firing at you while you're moving, you're going to have to fire back. Fire it's, back it's to definitely the windshield not, or out the window, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely not uh, practiced. It's not good practice either to fire at or into, uh, fire from at or into a moving vehicle. But you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, the windshield oh, is a safety glass and it would obscure your vision, first of all, but it's also going to deflect your bullet. But hey, if you're taking fire, you got to do something. Yeah, it'll deflect it down, supposedly. Shots fired! Shots fired! Police action shooting! Police action shooting! He's got a rifle! We got one officer hit. Drop the gun! Police, drop the gun! Police, drop the gun! Police, drop the gun! He's still moving! He's still moving! All right, hold fire! Hold fire, Matt! Police! Drop the gun! Police, drop the gun! Hey, stack on me! Stack on me! Let's move up! No, hang on, hang on. Okay, so this is Phelps. He he is, by the way, shot. He this is the this is the passenger in the, the lead vehicle. This is the guy that was trying to keep the driver, uh, the, the officer driver calm. The officer driver that's now out of the fight. De Leon De Leon. Yeah. He right. was driving, attempting to do the pit maneuver. He was frustrated when the pit maneuver didn't didn't succeed. He let out the F word. He was mad. But Phelps has kind of got it all together. He's like, calm down. We're going to get him. Go ahead, Drew. But his adrenaline is coursing so hard that he's not, uh, I, I won't say that he's tunnel visioned, but he is so intently in this fight. It's just an intense feeling because he probably, I, I think he says at some point in a second here, I'm shot. I'm hit. I'm hit in the stomach. But also, he's like stack on me, meaning you guys get behind me, and we're gonna move as an element forward, and we're gonna we're gonna go meet this threat. That's what you do in an active shooter. You stack on one another. You just like you'll put your hand on the back or on the shoulder of the person in front of you, and you know your gun is going one way. They're going their gun is going another way, and you just move forward kind of as an element. Uh, in some cases, so he's saying, "Stack on me, stack on me." We're going to go get this guy, and the and the voice of reason, who is in the car behind him, is saying, "Slow down a second. Everyone the reason, slow down." The reason why they stop have, shooting. The reason why go they ahead. don't just approach him all abreast is because what did we learn in the Revolutionary War? Don't walk around walking abreast because 
The guys could just mow you down. He's going to mow that's you right. down left to right, and he's going to get in his car, and he's going to go to Wendy's. So that's, that's why right. you would stack up behind one guy. Go ahead, Drew. All right. I'm down, John. Uh, I, I do see a legitimate question in there. I can't I can't find where it was, but um, you, there are a couple reasons to not – fire a gun in the car one is of course the glass danger especially if you're not wearing glasses yourself uh two you're both probably going to suffer permanent hearing damage if not hearing loss um and also but you know to be at the ready like look how quickly this all not to make a pun look how quickly this all popped off they weren't even out of the car yet and the guy was already firing at them so if they had to fumble fumble around with the you know level three retention holster trying to get their gun out and you know you, you just this is not the time to to hope that your fine motor skills work perfectly and you nail it uh you want to have that gun out and, and at the ready are they gonna hit hey i'm bleeding i'm bleeding i'm okay get the, i'm okay fuck this let's go we're good we're okay. We're okay. Hey, we got one gone. There's a male in a blue t-shirt. Last game running southbound. I got hit in the stomach. Get back. We got it. Get back. I got it. We're fine. One suspect down. Dark cars for perimeter. Officers could see. All right. So I, I'm going to tell you that um, I don't want that guy in the fight anymore. Dude. Dude, did you hear that radio traffic where they're talking about how one suspect had fled on foot and they're trying to set up cars for a perimeter? Is that yes. this or is that some other whole incident? Did somebody else? No, that's this. That's okay. this. Nope, that's this. There was a the reason. Was reason a, I bring uh, that up is because if there's something else going on, that just shows you what a shit show it is of a day. Because they like so they've got someone <laughs> fleeing on foot. They're setting up perimeters and this, you know. And sometimes <laughs> life's like that where it's like. Man, I got a structure fire. I'm sending out three fire departments. We need to get an ambulance out here. We need to do X, Y, and Z. Get the emergency management out here. We're going to need to get Red Cross out here. And then, you know, just, <laughs> and then, like, yeah, just a man starts pistol whipping his wife, you know, in a town that's far away and there's a burglary in progress. So I just, it would not have surprised me at all if that radio traffic we heard was for a completely different thing. Go ahead, Drew. Yeah. And then, just like that thing that we played in one of the first shows, that, that's, that's when the parking, the parking enforcement guy gets on the radio and he doesn't realize that his volume's turned down and he calls you six times, but you're answering him, but he can't hear you because his radio's turned down uh, and it's all in the middle of this. So we, we've got another legitimate question in there from, uh, from Michael. Um, he's wondering, you know, why are they arguing? Like, well, let's, let's think about it. Uh, the adrenaline is flowing like uh, on a scale of one to 10, it's probably at an 80 or a 90. Um, and he's just, uh, he's sufficiently pissed off that he's taken a round to the stomach and he wants to go kill this guy. And um, he doesn't realize that the guy's probably already dead. First of all, he doesn't see what the other guys see. And the, it's not necessarily an argument. You've got to remember that this, this officer who has emptied a, a magazine now and has reloaded probably isn't in his frame of mind, like isn't present. He's in another, he's in, it just, I, I don't know how to describe it. Like there's he's, auditory. He's, he's still in stop the threat mode. He hasn't reanalyzed the situation yes. to realize the situation's changed. He's in stop the threat mode, which means he, pressing forward, going after him until he sees that person is neutralized on the ground. He's, he's absolutely pressed forward. And Go there's ahead. what, what there's what's called code black, meaning you, you're just in a blackout. You're on autopilot, your, your muscle memory. This is why it's so important to train so much because your muscle memory just takes over for you. That's why it's so important to train the tactical reload. That's why it's so important to train the Alpha Bravo drills and all this other stuff. Because when you're in a shooting and you have this tunnel vision, you don't want to have to think about it. You want your body to take it over for you. Well, sometimes when you're in that condition black, and I'm not, you know, you don't, you don't know if that guy to the left of you is in condition black. You, you don't know if he's in complete sound mind or sane or, or whatever. It is always best unless you're taking active gunfire, obviously, to just slow things down for a second, evaluate what you got, see if the guy's just hiding out, laying in wait, or if he's laying dead next to a rifle, um, you know, maybe you don't need to rush up there right away. Maybe you can tactically move as an element to, to get up there a little bit more safely. And maybe you don't want to bring the guy that's already got a bullet hole. Maybe you want to bring somebody else. Maybe you want to stick him, you know, somewhere safe. And, and he's too amped up to realize like, man, you know, this thing could have pierced his gallbladder, his liver, and it was working its way towards his kidney. 
And any he's not part of his circulatory about. system. Yeah, I mean, anything can happen to him. It could drop like a stone. Blood pressure goes down. He's unconscious. And he's now he's a liability because they have to get him rescued. And you cannot bring an EMS yes. unit into this situation until you know that that gun is neutralized. So what are you going to do? Like drive him out of there get him out of the, the hot zone or the red zone or whatever you want to call it to wherever EMS is hopefully staged. Remember, this was a pursuit that happened after a surveillance. There's no reason, in my opinion necessarily why ems would already be staged hopefully now, they're staging your fight go ahead this was a pursuit that happened during a surveillance so so exactly. it's even worse so that's exactly my point Drew. so there's no ems yeah. pre-staged by unless they already had a special detachment saying like sometimes when we serve high risk warrants like if we're going after someone and we're expecting a gunfight at a house where we're serving a warrant we'll have ems staged by however even if that was the case they went on a trip they went down past Wendy's, grabbed a Frosty, and now they're behind this random street that doesn't even have good access to it. You could only access it one way behind them. And so my point being is that there's not necessarily an ambulance close by. They already need to get him out of there if he's taking shots anyway. And uh, it's just a mess from a logistics and EMS standpoint. Right. Uh, and, and, and just, you know, thinking kind of rationally, uh, if there's no bullets flying your way, uh, what is the rush to get down there? Be, because until you can evaluate it, like, again, he, he almost crashed into a tree that the suspect did. He almost crashed into a tree. So obviously he's behind residences. You can get people set up in, in different areas to get a better uh, vantage point or eyeball on him to see what he's doing, to see if he's reloading, to see if he's down or whatever. Uh, you may not want to just rush right up to him. Uh, very good you know, very good point there's a neighborhood just to the east of this when you check out the map when the video starts so they're behind like a, a plaza or a strip mall it doesn't have an outlet but just to the east is a neighborhood now we already talked earlier about the possibility of high velocity rounds but you know what just guns anyway and like kids and normal people swimming in the pool and just being alive babies and cribs we got guns flying as soon as we can like maybe you know subdue the gun violence if we're sure that we're not still in a gunfight i say maybe hold back a little bit I don't know. I've never been in a gunfight. Drew, keep going. That Mr. Gabriel's rifle was within his reach. They used a ballistic shield to approach him and secure the weapon. Uh -huh. Upon approaching Mr. Gabriel, officers quickly determined that he was deceased. There were no other occupants in the car as the passenger had fled on foot. So they stay behind the shield. There's, this, there's a rifle pointed down range, you know, towards where Iwet is. Uh, the, the Gabri I went the uh, suspect and they are giving him commands uh, he's probably dead they don't know that uh, so they're just moving uh, as an element they, they have the safety and comfort of that shield it's not necessarily going to stop every single bullet uh, but they definitely have some kind of protection and they're making their way through some thick brush towards the minivan where the guy was and they are able to determine that yes um, He's, he's dead in there, or he's dead next to, to the uh, minivan, and, and the uh, the rifle is nearby. They're working in a stack. One officer in front of the other. They got rifles at high ready. Guys, it's out just back there. A rifle was located next to Mr. Gebri Iwet, who was pronounced deceased at the scene. The lead patrol car occupied by that. detectives DeLeon and Phelps. A bunch of bullet holes in the hood and the windshield um, and, and, and extensive damage like they show close up of the bullet holes. Like the, and it's a damn it, shame it, that car was one day away from retirement. <laughs> was struck by multiple rounds fired by Mr. Gebri Iwit. The passenger in the vehicle was apprehended in the 2700 block of Post Road shortly after the incident. The passenger the, was uninjured. The passenger probably soiled himself, let's be honest. Probably. I mean, it, it's, it, there's a good chance that the, the passenger was like, holy shit, he's shooting him. I don't I want any part, part of this. Like, Hopefully he's me. like, crime doesn't pay. <laughs> 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 I hope he thought that. Crime doesn't pay. Yes. I'm done. He, he remembered his McGruff uh, lectures. Um, so that's that. You, you can hear why I wanted to have that uh, radio traffic. Uh, I, I really wish that we could because 
even in all of the mayhem of them trying to like walk up on this suspect, they're all on the same channel and, and half of them want to go to a different channel. So um, because they're going to trans what ended up happening, by the way, is both officers were thrown into the back of patrol car or patrol cars and driven straight to a, a trauma hospital. That's it's kind of a trend in law enforcement right now. Instead of waiting around for EMS, let's oh, just yeah. get them in the in the back of a patrol car because we could probably get them there quicker. And yes. unless they need immediate trauma care, like things you are could really, also, really bad. You could you could do an ALS intercept where you could say, "Hey, the police are heading towards the ambulance. Can you have the could you have the ambulance intercept them at the Chevron station that's already in the route?" You could do that hypothetically. You could do that hypothetically. I th- I would think your your chances of getting them to a trauma center would be better if you just floored it, to be honest. But um, that's because you're big city, Drew. If you're out here in the countryside, <laughs> you might have a good chance of getting an ALS intercept somewhere in the 20 miles between you and the hospital. That's true. Okay. You, you might have some old doctor uh, in his crop duster just just laying right on the highway and pick them up and uh, strap them to the wing and get them to the hospital. Uh, so you, you've got all that, uh, going on and, and they're trying to, they're trying to figure out, uh, where this other guy is because they don't know if he's got a gun. They don't know if he's going to run into a bank and take a bunch of people hostage. You know, obviously they have to locate this guy. He was part of the incident. He, he, he may be the suspect. So they have, to, or he, they, he may be another suspect. So they have to identify him. He's associating himself with this guy who is involved in a shooting investigation. So there's no two ways about it, but they are still in the process of like tippy toeing kind of up to make sure that this guy is not going to shoot them. And you got a whole other um, faction of officers that are just swarming the area looking for this other guy. They're probably trying to set a good perimeter so the canine can get out and start tracking and, and all this other stuff, but the scene's not completely safe yet. So, there's a lot of things to th- things to think about, a lot of confusion going on, and they're all on the same channel. So that's why they made the they made you know the request to kind of split off into the two channels. Uh, you know, if I ever get the the audio back, maybe we'll revisit this at some. Well, some we should point. play the audio just over next episode, whatever that is. Yeah, thank you for getting me mid step. I appreciate that. So what we're <laughs> what, the what we're pause gonna, was perfect. Where you're like, is he serious? <laughs> what we're gonna. Uh, so that's that's kind of the end of this. Both of the officers survived, uh, thankfully. Good job. Um, and and obviously there is an uptick in, in gun violence in Indianapolis, or they wouldn't have the gun task force. And the chief said it, nothing short of that in uh, several. Pre- there was an assistant chief that gave a press conference at the, and really got passionate and raised his voice. And then uh, the the chief came out and made a statement too, like we're tired of we're just tired of these guns on the street and we're tired of criminals having them and we're tired of criminals shooting our officers. I mean, it's, uh, I don't think it's too much to ask to not shoot and kill our police officers. It's uh, common I don't courtesy. Get, I, I don't get who wakes up in the morning and decide, decides I'm going to start some shit today and picks up a gun. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I don't, I don't get that. You know, I'm not exactly Mr. Perfect. I don't go volunteer at the library. I help women cross the street, but I, I don't understand that. And uh, just, uh, you know, as far as empathy for the guy, you live by the gun, you die by the gun. Maybe this That's was always right. coming. You had a chance to to change at any point and you, you chose trouble. So, some of these guys, I, I think John's dealt with them enough in prison. Um, not when John was in prison, but when he was worked in a prison. Well, um, first one, then the other. I think, I, I think, I think he would agree that a lot of these guys are like, yeah, I, I'm not going out. <laughs> I'm not going to choke on a ham sandwich when I die. I mean, I'm going out in a blaze of glory because I've that's heard, a sign of. I've heard blaze of glory before. Yeah, it, it, some of them kind of romanticize that, you know, Bonnie and Clyde style. Uh, you know, yeah, going I, out. Like, I'm going out like an outlaw. I've heard them say, you know, <laughs> right, which is a, a, a country rock band. So let let me just show you a teaser of what I want to a, a case I want to do that's very similar to this one. Uh, I, I hit my friend up. Luis, he's a photographer. I don't want to give away too many details, but um, he's a it law enforcement he uses enthusiast. A camera, you know, not disclosing too much there. He's he's also an enthusiast, so like he takes the greatest pictures, and he had some video of stuff. But the the reason I ran across his stuff was because of this case that we had in Tampa, which I'm teasing for one of the next times. I don't know when we're going to do it exactly, but I was directly involved in this case. Um, hold on a second. Why is that? 
for doing that. Oh no, that's Denlig. That's from right. multiple. Dead uh, to break there we go. To there we go. To a and so that's you in the car that's rolling over the, the red one. Yes, that was me. I was. Uh, oh my gosh! For lunch. Job. You no, missed a pedestrian. Um, Hot damn. No, take just take a, take note of this. Uh, we'll mute the. Take note of this. You'll see. They bump him. They try to pit him. He wipes out into a median. This is in Tampa now. Um, and you'll see smoke come from both. You see it, the, the, the smoke just starts popping from the, um, from the vehicle and from the, uh, uh, from both vehicles. So th there's a set of detectives that are following him, just like in this case that we did in Indianapolis. And there's a lone gunman in this uh, car who did a series of sexual batteries and series oh. of armed robberies before he fled in this vehicle. Uh, it was a very, very wild night. It was a very wild situation. Uh, and I, I know that there is better quality video of this, but I just kind of wanted to tease it for a minute. Like, you'll see him driving down U.S. Highway 301, and uh, they end up, of all, all places, uh, right wiped out in front of a Waffle House. So that's where that guy met his last moments. They have great um, service and, there. Yeah, and uh, and – you know, that's the hurricane test too, by the way, you know, the hurricane series if the waffle house is closed. Right. And, um, so we, I want to cover this story in, in, in great detail. Uh, in an we should. I like that picture of the suspect. One thing that you just love for prison is you, there's a way to tell if he's guilty. Cause there's a lot of guys who come in and they say, well, you know, I, I didn't do this. Or my favorite quote was I'm only here. Cause I knew a guy that tried to get himself murdered, but if they take their booking photo and their chins jet out like this, they did it because they're proud to be there. They get they, that's that's the moment they've been thinking about the entire time they're going through their sham of a court trial. <laughs> what they're gonna look like in their booking photo, because that's their photo for the next 20 years. And they're like, I'm gonna look like they all do this. They jut their chin out. I almost I almost think it's like a weird sociological phenomenon that I should devote my life towards uh, figuring out. Uh, I wanted to mention some of the super chats. David J, who keeps this uh podcast afloat, the show is brought to you by David J. Uh, if you want a podcast, please consult David J. Uh, he's out there somewhere on the West Coast. And then also, that's Love Act Manned Carry. Uh, always good in the chats. He says, keep fighting for $5. He, you know, less than David, but always reliable. Thank you, that's Love. Not sure what's going on with you in life, but it's always good to see you here every week, buddy. Listen, I, I've decoded all of that. And uh, he, he I've decoded he, part of it. But not he all has of it. said it's mandatory carry, and I, I do believe the first part of his name is load vest. No, it's just it's spelled backwards. So it's probably his last name spelled backwards. But uh, listen, uh, this was uh, yet another brainchild of of John. This was a great, great footage that he found. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to put it together with the audio, which I wanted to bring to you. But we didn't have we enough time. Across. We didn't have a week to work on it. <laughs> well, we did. We we had sufficient time had I not just emailed them yesterday. Um, all right. So until next time we meet again, please, if you're a member on YouTube, go r run. Don't walk. Check out that John Mattingly interview. He is a humble, uh, brilliant human being. Uh, so check that out. Uh, nice. Until then, this is me, Drew Breezy. That's John. Uh, difficult to look at pictures is his Instagram handle. I've got nothing else. John, do you have anything? Good night, America. John, John stick around. <laughs>